Hey guys, welcome to my weekly Q&A session. Great to have you here with me. I'm in Lyon, France today. And uh, yeah, I have a few questions I'm gonna run through today. So if you have another and you're seeing this live, add them to the comments and I'll try and get back to you. Let me run through a few quick housekeeping things here. Number one, if you're on YouTube, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. You'll see the cute little button somewhere there in the corner, hit that and that will subscribe you and you'll be informed of future videos. Secondly, please do subscribe to our weekly email newsletter as well. It's the, probably the best way we have of keeping in touch with people. We have a free gift for everybody who uh, signs up for our email news. Um, what else is going on? Hey, do look through my uh, YouTube channel as well. We've got lots of previous Q&A we've done. We do a daily video and some online courses there. So boom, let's jump into these things. So today I've got five questions. Uh, number one, how do we deal with depression as Christians? Number two, why are relationships so difficult? Question number three, how do we raise godly children? Question number four says, help, I find prayer boring. <laughs> okay, you're honest. And uh, question number five, should all Christians speak in tongues? So I'm gonna jump into these. Excuse me, I'm gonna put my sunglasses on because uh, it is bright, bright, bright out here. And uh, good, so question number one, how do we deal with depression? Let me put a timer on here so I don't talk too long on this one. But um, wow, so much I wanna say about this and it's gonna be hard to do that in five minutes. But uh, probably the most important thing I would say is if you are going through depression, especially if you think, you know, have thoughts of suicide, anything of that kind of thing, get help, reach out and get some help. Please, watching a YouTube video can be a good way of getting help, but uh, why not actually get some real help, contact the church, contact even a non-Christian help group if you need that. Don't be alone in those things. So I really wanna start off by saying that. Uh, secondly, I'd say this, I really wanna say this to anybody whenever we get to this subject of depression. At times I'll hear Christians and they're usually well-meaning, but often they're well-meaning idiots. And it's like they'll come and pat somebody on the back and say, there, 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 just cheer up, it's okay. Depression isn't real, it's easy to bounce this stuff off. And uh, you know, that can be true at times for some people, it really cannot. And if you've never gone through something where, you know, I've helped people, um, you know, where this touches the depths of the soul, I've been at times with people who can just barely get out of bed in the morning and the whole, you know, it's real, okay? It doesn't, we can help people get out of that, but it's not helpful to simply just pretend it's not real. What we're doing when we do that is to brush it under the carpet and throw it away. You know, let me say this as well, just pastorally. I mean, I don't, I never advocate drugs and I never unadvocate drugs. I'm talking about legal drugs. By that I'm saying, I would never go and pray for somebody and say, oh, you're on medication, just throw all your medication away. And my goal would be to help them get off that medication quickly, but also safely. And I just want to say that because I've, I've seen Christians do silly things at times, like tell people to throw away their pills, you know, flush them down the toilet as an act of faith. Faith doesn't come by throwing away medication. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So let's, let's, with those disclaimers, jump into this. Ah, so much I'd want to say. Come on, number one, if you, <laughs> number one again, if you're going through depression, there is help for you. God can and God will, God wants to complete you, completely set you free in this area. Completely set you free. Either sunsets free is free indeed. But in my experience, it's quite easy. There's a journey to get people free and then there's a journey to teach somebody to live free in the realm of their emotions. So I would actually say get around a church, get around a good group that can help you get free. I think I can get you free in about five minutes. Yeah, but then find a group that will help you. And at times this could be the work of months, help you live free, help you put on freedom. And again, I just, it's not really the venue to say that here. My advice as a pastor, anybody would be with depression would be number one, get rid of baggage that you may not be aware you have. <clears throat> so often depression is simply frozen anger. It's the things we haven't dealt with. We put in the freezer or we brushed under the carpet and we wonder why years, years later, it's having this gravitational pull upon our soul. And I would say, do some prayer, do some work and say, God, are there things, are there grief, are there anger, are there things I've gone through that I've never really dealt with? I've only really 
been through depression once in my life. And it was actually after the death of my mother, around about 2017, I believe it was. And my mother died quite suddenly in the summer. I was away on vacation <clears throat> at the time. And um, yeah, you know, I kind of dealt with that. That is what it is. And then suddenly, a few months later, this thing began to really hit me and like way down in my soul. And I had no conception of even where it came from. I don't think I even really kind of made the connection with the thing with my mom at times. And I prayed about it and God showed me that I hadn't really grieved, I hadn't really dealt with that. I'd been so busy that I just plowed on with life and that I had to, as it were, really lay that grief to rest and deal with that. So firstly, just deal with things you need to deal with. Secondly, I would deal with, learn to renew your mind so often what we feel, what we experience, is actually just the reflection of the things that we're thinking upon. And the danger, you know, if I got you thinking about some really great, exciting, fun thing right now, you'll begin feeling nice. Now, that's obvious. The problem is, we, be, we, God has made us in such an amazing way. We can get this thing on autopilot, where after a while, we begin thinking negative, dark, down thoughts, and we don't even know we're doing it. And then, after a while, the fact that we're feeling something causes us to think about it, and the fact, that, the fact that we're thinking about it causes us to feel it, and we end up in this sort of spiral, uh, like this tailspin situation, where we can't even unpick anymore where the chicken and the egg started, um, because, wow, you know, this thing has been going on so long. So I would be praying and saying, Lord, what am I feeling? Don't ever deny your feelings, but I would say deny their permanence, deny their authority to dictate your life, um, and learn to think on whatever things are good, pure, lovely. Learn to direct your thoughts in a different direction. Yeah. You know, the last thing I'd say here again, and I'm, I'm just aware how, whoops, how shallow this can be uh, in one sense, but I would say this, this is really true. There's something powerful about praise and worship. I think if you look through the Bible, David, King David, dealt with depression. At times, I would say David dealt with things with literally like bipolar depression, you know, highs and lows. And in so many of the Psalms, you'll see David pouring out his soul, why are you downcast on my soul, Psalm 42 says. And yet his answer is not to make everything perfect in his life. His answer is hope thou in God. And his answer is in praise and worship. And the way we get rid of the spirit of heaviness is by putting on the garment of praise. The way we get rid of the oil of mourning is with the oil of gladness. And I tell you, learning to worship, worship through your pain, worship through your, the depression in your soul, there's actually a wonderful place of worship, like a place called lamentation, when we can bring our pain to God. We're not blaming God for the pain. Sometimes we're not even asking him for a way out and answer, but we're saying, though he slay me, yet will I praise him. Though the fig tree shall not blossom, there'll be no fruit in the vine, the labor of the olive fail, yet I will joy in the God of my salvation. And I tell you, if you will begin to deal with your past, learn to put your mind on the things of God, and learn in the midst of pain, of suffering and depression, to worship the Lord, this will turn, this will begin to turn. And let me finish where I've ended by saying, guys, get some help in that situation, really. Get help if you need it. There's no shame whatsoever in asking for help. Oh, that helps. Boom. Right, quick coffee. And uh... Question number two, why are relationships so difficult? <laughs> I don't know. I wish I knew. Um, <laughs> you know, it's called sin. That's why. Here's the real challenge, actually. The Bible says the heart of man is desperately wicked. Who can know it? And the challenge is, we don't even know our own hearts. And then we get around other people who are broken, who are sinners, just like you and I are, who are selfish, who are insecure, who are terrified, who are ambitious. You know, all of this stuff goes on. And we're, it's like we're living on different planets kind of like shouting at each other at times or really trying our best to communicate things and so often you know it's really like like somebody writing a text message if I was to write you a text message right now I think I think I know what I mean even that's doubtful there's what I mean to say there's what I actually say what I set down in the text of the message there's what you read and then there's what you understand from what you read, which is filtered through a million other things. We don't see people as they are. 
we see people as we are. So how do we learn to do relationships well? Number one, this sounds negative, but I think it's actually really empowering to know if we'll actually start, if our premise is relationships are really, really hard, most of us don't want to accept that. Most of us want to live with this fallacy that relationships are really easy and then we blow from one to another to another and we keep being surprised by why we always fall over and this breakup if we'd actually start by saying this is really really difficult I'm probably going to get this wrong the other person's probably going to get this wrong the only way of doing this is having a whole load of grace yeah so start with the fact that this is difficult number one number two I think we should just come to relationships with a great deal of humility I don't think I know anybody who doesn't think they're good at relationships and I don't think I know anybody who's good at relationships. My point is we, we all have this tendency to think we're good at this and we're not that good at it. So start with just a lot of humility. Start by really pressing into being humble, being you, taking your time. Um, I think thirdly, we should over communicate and then we should over communicate and then communicate some more. And by that, you know, one thing that's really helped me as a pastor, as a leader, is I never, ever have discussions with anybody by text, by text message, not really by email if I can help it. I don't even really do them by phone or by Zoom or by those things. You know, occasionally I'll have to. You know, I was going to meet some folks while I was here in France and they live about four hours drive away, so it was an eight hours drive. And in the end, I'm like, hey, we'll do a Zoom thing. And it's so much easier, I know. But I know there's just nothing like being in the room with somebody the, the body language, feeling the heart, taking the time. There's actually something really powerful when we say to somebody, hey, I'm willing to drive hours and hours and hours and pay gas price, current gas prices and all sorts of things and put value on this relationship. And I think if we want relationships to go well, we really want to communicate. And of course, communicate doesn't mean being quiet while you think of the next thing you're going to say it really means listening at times it means repeating back to the other person what you think you've heard and letting them affirm that and really just most of us need to communicate about 10 times more than we think we do it's really important hey my last thought about relationships would be this as well i think relationships are like a garden and uh, we need to sow we need to water we need to cultivate Sometimes if you have everything right in a garden, you can, you know, you can roll for a few days, a few weeks, you can go with that and it will all will be well. But you've got to stay on top of it. You've got to keep sowing into them. You can't assume, well, this relationship was great 10 years ago, so it will stay that way. No, we've got to constantly sow into these things. Boom. So just some thoughts on relationship. Mm. Good. Question number three today, how do we raise godly children? And... Um, I have three kids, I, I don't know, but I hope I'm qualified to, to answer this question. Maybe you should ask my wife, maybe you should ask my kids, maybe you should ask my neighbors, but um, how do we raise godly children? Um, go on, let's jump into this. Number one, if you're a parent, uh, you have a call to raise godly children. I really mean that God gave you a charge. It's like God's literally given you a commission. And it's really important that we, we actually receive that from heaven not from a doctor, not, um, oh, my wife's pregnant, or, yo, oh, this happened, or that happened. We should actually see God, before the foundation of the world, chose this unique child created in his image and his likeness, and he let you be the custodian. Wow, what a, what a crazy responsibility in a way. What a glorious responsibility. So key number one, we should look at this as God has, I have, I have a call on my life. I have a call to preach the gospel, yeah call to plant churches, call to help leaders. Those are, those are less important to me than the calls to raise my children, Sila. I'm not gonna sacrifice my family on the altar of my ministry. So number one, you got a call from God. Number two, whatever God calls you to do, he gives you the ability and the grace to fulfill those calls. That's a really powerful thing. So if you're a parent, maybe you're a new parent, maybe you're a parent struggling with teens right now, or, Realize this, it's not you, you need to raise them, but not you, Christ in you. And God has already made available to you the, the grace package, the enabling that you're required, um, everything you'll need to fulfill that mission. 
You know, I have a few friends who've worked as expats in different countries. Here in France, I have some. There's some folks who worked in Japan, in different countries like that. And um, it's interesting. Usually when these big companies will send somebody to a foreign nation, so to speak, on post, um, there's a whole package they get when they go there. Obviously a great salary that compensates the sacrifice they're making, but they're getting help with housing, they're getting help with schooling, help with accommodation, help with you know maybe a sports club, a social club. Everything they need comes in the package of that mission. And everything you need to raise your kids, God's, that grace is there available in you. And you need to learn to draw on that grace. And frankly, you need by faith to draw on that grace. So you need to believe that God has given you the grace to raise those children. It's a really important point. Come on. Point number three, I'd say this. We, I said in an earlier question, we need to communicate 10 times more than we think we do. I think when it comes to kids, we need to discipline more than we think, and we need to love more than we think. We need to major, major, major in love, and we need to major, major, major in discipline. And kids, kids really need, man, they need love. They're created from God. They're created from love. They're created from God is love, they're created for love, and even an unborn child. It's so, in one sense, there's no greater thing that we can ever do than hold our kids and just love them and let them let their soul be marinated in the fact that their parents, their mom and their dad, love them. That's a really, really important thing to do. Secondly, we've got to give them discipline. And uh, most people don't struggle that much that I know with the love thing, but many do with the discipline thing. And I encourage you, have hard edges on your disciplines. And I'm not even telling you what those disciplines should be, but be someone who keeps your word. If you're going to tell them they're going to finish their dinner, make sure they finish their dinner. If you're going to tell them they're going to be in bed at 9 p.m., make sure they go to bed at 9 p.m. And what all kids will do, nearly all kids, is come and test those hard edges to see if they're hard, to see, did you really mean what you said? and they will shout and scream and that sinful nature, hello, it's in there. Uh, you'll see that coming out all over the place and it's just really important. There's, there's, there's no better, well, one of the greatest things we can do with our kids is raise them with discipline. The goal of our discipline in our kids is not that they will spend their life being disciplined by us. The goal of our discipline is self-discipline, is self-control, is self uh, mastering in a way and it's so important that we do that that we put these boundaries around them boom hey let me give you two other keys here as well and I know there's so much more we could say about this um, <clears throat> I think as parents we're responsible and I actually think we're gonna give an account before God for the environment in which we place our kids now I mean the home I mean the church I mean the friends I mean the Netflix, the movies, the TV series, whatever. And I mean the school, frankly. And uh, I think it's really important that we, we don't simply hand over our kids to the state to educate them. It's not the job of the state to educate your kids. Now, my wife and I are homeschool. I, I'm not saying it's wrong to send your kids to a state or private education. What I'm saying is it's wrong to simply hand over and hand off and no longer be involved in that yourself. If you're going to pay, even through your taxes, for somebody to educate your children, find out what they're teaching, find out what they're learning, be involved in that, argue with the teachers if necessary. I mean, I, I would often ask, you know, as a pastor, I've asked people this question, at what point, what would it take for you to pull your kids out of a public school? I'm not saying you need to, I'm simply saying you, know, you need to know at what point, you need to know what they're being taught. You know, we can't simply just throw this off and just say, um, you know, well, it's no longer my business now. It's the job of the town or the state to educate them. No, it's your job. Find out what's going in there. Lastly, I'd say this when it comes to kids. Pray. Listen to God. God's got the right. I think there are, there are in my understanding, like little rendezvous, little moments, little windows of opportunity in the life of children where we can speak into their life, where we can help them move further in their life with God when we can tell them the truth, when we can mentor them, when we can spend time and connect with them. And every child is different. So the real key to raising godly children is walking by the Spirit and relying on the Spirit of the Lord, not on some silly book you read somewhere, but relying on Holy Spirit to raise that child in the way he shall go. When he's old, he will not depart from it. 
my very last key I would say this why not pray and ask God to show you a vision maybe like a prophetic vision or you know what I mean just how does God see the future of your children and I think if you can see them not as they are in the now but in the future it's an act of faith if you can look at them I think God looks at us in our on, on in process on journey in our brokenness and in our sanctification as it's happening but he sees us in the fullness of who we will be he sees who we were he's for, forgotten and forgiven our sins he sees who we are but he also sees who we will be in the future so I think if we can look at our children through the lens of hope through the lens of promise that will be a really empowering thing boom <clears throat> good question number four today was uh, was simply this, help, I find prayer boring. <laughs> right, let me give you some keys that will help you with this. Um, I mean, number one, it's good to be honest, so bravo, clap, clap, clap. Uh, if you find prayer boring, I mean, it's good you tell me that, but what do you tell God? I think God will, I don't think God will be angry if you go, I think God knows actually, yeah. I remember once years ago praying and I'm, it's like 4 a.m. and I'm, it's like I've got into this mindset that the earlier I get up, the more God's gonna be impressed. And I'm sitting there half asleep, it's like coffee dribbling down my chin. I like I'm, I'm just in absolute misery. And then it it's suddenly it's like God broke through and said to me, Graham, if you're miserable, why do you think I'm enjoying it? I want I want to enjoy it when you enjoy it. So key number one, be honest with God. That's a really good thing if you can go to God and say, uh, I'm not enjoying this. <laughs> key number two, start small. I think sometimes we're actually worshipping some idol, some image of what it could be to have this wonderful prayer life and these talk with the angels and spend hours in heaven rather than doing something small, simple and powerful. And frankly, if you don't pray regularly, start. I mean, literally take one minute a day and pray some really simple, honest prayers. I, I'm guarant I guarantee that you will take benefit from that if you'll start small and just literally, you know, build that prayer life rather than wait for some glorious thing to happen third thing i'll say is this learn the keys of faith you see frankly we find prayer boring because it, we're not getting anything out of it and uh you know there's really two keys in that number one put something into it and number two learn the ways of faith so i'll finish with these things if you're not getting anything out of it put something in it and by that i mean why not start with worship before you come to god with a shopping list you know if i were going to pray for half an hour Probably 20 minutes of that is worship. It's about who God is, not about my shopping list of prayer requests. It's about who God actually really is. And I think there's just something wonderful about us um, spending time to love Him. Rather, so, you know, like going to a stove and saying, I don't get any heat out of this stove, put some wood in it. If you're coming in prayer and saying, I'm not getting anything out of this, Put some thinking in it, put some prayer into it, put some worship, put some adoration, the French would say, into it. And lastly, learn the ways of faith. And by that I mean, again, instead of coming to God with a shopping list, it's not wrong to have the shopping list, but why not come to Him based on His promises? Literally quote His word back to Him. Pray with confidence that He will fulfill His promise. And then, really, the whole law of faith, Jesus summed it at best in Mark 11, 24. He said, what things you desire, that's a shopping list, <clears throat> at the moment you pray, right then, believe you have received it, and then you'll see it happen. <clears throat> and here's what that would mean. Like, imagine I'm coming to God today and praying about um, maybe a gift I want to buy or, or a person I'm going to be meeting later, and I give God that situation. I pray. I say, Lord, I believe you're going to work this out. You're going to make a way. You're going to provide what I need. And I believe I have received it. And that means at the moment that prayer's finished, the moment I say, Amen, I've got it. If you came to me and you said, Graham, do you think God's going to answer that prayer? I'd say, no, he's already answered it. He answered it when I prayed, not when I saw it. And if you came to me later that day and said, Graham, has it come yet? I'd say, none of your business. I, it came when I prayed. The fig tree died when I spoke. I received it when I prayed and I'm in celebration and thanks for that. And if you bring faith to prayer, suddenly, bam, you will start enjoying your prayer life. See that. Hey, my last question today uh, was simply this one. Somebody asked the question, should all Christians speak in tongues? Yes. <laughs> um, okay, I know there's some different views on this. Let me show God's view on this. 
You know, I once heard somebody say, you know, to some, well, you, we all worship God, you in your way, I in his. So <laughs> here's God's answer to this. I, I really believe all Christians should, can, and should speak in tongues. So a few quick comments on that. Number one, it doesn't mean you, you, don't, you have to speak in tongues. God loves you if you don't speak in tongues. I want to say that. So there's no like second class Christians in some way. God loves all of his children the same. Maybe some are in first class, some have taken the economy ticket, but all of them can join him in a first class Christian experience. So you don't have to do anything to prove something to somebody else. I don't think you have to speak in tongues to prove Holy Spirit's in you. I think it's really useful, I think you should, but I don't think you have to. Have to is not a good phraseology, a good language to attach to something like speaking in tongues. Okay. Secondly, I think sometimes people get confused over these verses. Paul talks in 1 Corinthians 12, 13 and 14 about spiritual gifts, but he also talks about, he talks about the way the Spirit of the Lord will manifest himself in a gathering, kind of about personal use of spiritual gifts, but also about spiritual gifts that we'd maybe term more like an office. So for instance, Paul says, are all apostles? And the obvious answer is no. Are all prophets? No. And then he says, do all, literally says, do all bring a message in tongues? One would assume the answer to that would be no. So you say, aha, Graham, not everybody speaks in tongues. Well, okay. But when Paul says, are all prophets? No. One chapter later, Paul says, but you can all prophesy one by one. Yeah? So I think there's a difference between being a prophet and somebody moving in the gift of prophecy that everybody can move in. I think there are specific people who God will use in a public sense in the, both the interpretation of tongues, but actually bringing forth a public tongue. And in my experience, I think everybody could step into that, but not everybody does. But I have never seen anybody. The Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians 14, I want you all to speak in tongues. That's in your Bible, folks, Baptists. Don't tear chunks out of the Bible. Don't play exegetical origami with the Bible. He says, I want you all to speak in tongues, 1 Corinthians 14. And then he says, I want you all to prophesy. Yeah, so that's Paul's idea. The last verse in 1 Corinthians 12, of all things being done decent and in order, is a church that doesn't forbid people to speak in tongues and prophesy. So, I, I would say this to you. I've never met anybody, anybody in my life who wanted that gift of tongues, who couldn't have it if they were just helped a little bit and encouraged into that. I think the biggest challenge is sometimes people are waiting for God to come and grab a hold of their mouth and waggle their mouth and force them to speak in tongues. You know, I was like that when I was a young Christian. I wanted the gift of tongues and I prayed and begged and pleaded and uh, got disappointed because I didn't get it. If you would have actually come to me and said, well, Graham, what does actually getting it mean? I really couldn't have told you. I wanted to speak in tongues, but I was waiting for God to speak in tongues. Now, God really set me up for me. The way I got speaking in tongues was a few days after I prayed, I woke up one morning half asleep and I suddenly realized I was speaking in tongues in my sleep. God had to put me to sleep to get my mind out of the way. And I, I don't think you have to do that in your sleep, but I do think so often our minds get in the way. So I'd encourage anybody, reach out, ask the Lord for that gift, believe you have received it, as in the answer to the last question. And then just begin to speak out to him. Hebrews 11, 8 says, by faith, Abraham left, not knowing where he was going. So why not leave? Why not start without knowing where you're going? And just begin to speak out to the Lord from your heart, psalms, hymns, spiritual songs. But if you'll do that, you'll find words will come to you that you don't know. Now, what will usually happen is another little voice in your head will say, you're not, that's not God, that's you. You're making that up. It's Satan. He's a liar and the father of lies. So... I encourage you, just press into the things of God and that will begin to flow from you. Boom. Thanks for making it this far, guys. And uh, again, hit that subscribe button if you're on YouTube and uh, hope to see you soon in the plan of God. Bye for now.